seated. And turn your Bibles to John chapter 14. Find the book of Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament. And turn over a few books and you'll find the Gospel of John. If you don't have a Bible, you could find one under the seat in front of you. Uh, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Everybody find John chapter 14. Where are we today? What book? All right. John chapter 14. All right. We've all seen commercials where someone tries to convince you to try a product or a service. For example, Geico tries to convince people they'll save 15% by switching to them. Or if you remember the juicing fad that was around a few years ago, um, you saw all those commercials with trying to convince you to buy, try their juicer. They didn't talk about how much you'd have to buy in fruit and vegetables, right? Um, you also have the uh, Coke and Pepsi ba battle about which soda is better. And then you all remember the clapper where you turn off the lights or, you know, by just clapping. They're still around, by the way. And of course, my favorite commercial that's going on right now, I absolutely love it. The ones that Twix has with the left and right Twix. I just absolutely love that commercial. I think it's so creative. Um, I go to the store and if I only see right, I say, do you have, have any left? And then I'll leave without buying it if they don't have any left Twix. But nonetheless, in all these commercials, there is a spokesperson who's trying to convince us to try their product. They tell us how they use the product and why we should use the product as well. Monica had taught a class in one of her classes where they examined persuasive elements of, of commercials. And she tells me that in all commercials, they utilize three types of appeals. They appeal to the logos, ethos, and pathos. To appeal to the logos, the spokesperson appeals to the listener's logic or reasoning. And so they use logical evidence like scientific facts or data, their real life examples or personal anecdotes to appeal to the ethos. The spokesperson focuses on their character or ethics that and then what they're doing is they're trying to build credibility or trustworthiness. And so they present themselves as being likable, sincere, fear minded. And then they appeal to the pathos um, and um, that is to appeal to the uh, emotions. And that is done through the use of language and emotional examples. And so in essence, people in commercials are paid witnesses whose job it is to get us to purchase a product. And so today I want to be a witness. I want to share a testimonial. This is not a commercial, but I want to show you from the scripture why I tried Jesus Christ and appeal to you that if you have not yet tried Jesus Christ, that you should also. So you should be in John chapter 14, right? Um, let's get a running head start by reading the first six verses. John 14, one through six. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this passage of scripture, or even just this verse, verse 6, I pray that you would open our hearts to your word. Perhaps the application for us is that we need to share this passage with someone that we know who doesn't know Christ, even if we're here and we know Christ. And perhaps 
uh, there is somebody here who does not know Christ. They have not put their faith and trust in him. And this morning, they would. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open all of our hearts and allow us to listen. Lord, help us not to be focused on what our neighbor is doing or what's going on elsewhere in the building or what we have to do this afternoon. But we would just spend these few moments listening to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let me refresh your memory on the context in which this passage takes place. Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room, and it's Thursday night. It's the night before the crucifixion. They're celebrating Passover, and they're in the upper room next to Jesus. On one side is John the Apostle, and on the other side is Judas Iscariot. And as we know, it would be Judas who would betray uh, Jesus. And then if you remember, right before that, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And during this foot washing ceremony, Jesus gets into a discussion with Peter about being clean. You remember that? If you remember when Jesus got to Peter in terms of washing his feet, um, he didn't want his foot to be washed. And he said, not just my feet, but all of me. Then look at Jesus' reply, John 13, 10. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he says, not all of you are clean. And so he's not talking about taking a shower here. That's not what he's talking about. His point was that not everyone in that room had had the bath of salvation. And specifically, he was referring to Judas. Judas was never saved. You see, we can argue that all day long. But Judas, some people will say, well, Peter denied Christ and Judas betrayed Christ. But what happened to Peter? He got the Lord's forgiveness. Judas never got the Lord's forgiveness. He went and he, he, he took his life. And he's in hell, not because he took his life, but because he was never forgiven by Christ, all right? And so if somebody is saved, and even if they take their life, they will not go to hell. Since we're there, I might as well deal with that, all right? Now, Judas, he leaves the upper room, and he puts into motion the betrayal of Jesus. And then Jesus starts to speak to the remainder of the disciples about his own departure. As we had just read in the passage before in verses 1 through 6, um, he was talking about leaving. And this talk hit the disciples like a ton of bricks. Where is he going, they wondered. Why can't we go with him? And Jesus is telling them, if you want to get out of this world... And if you want to go where I'm going and go to the place that I'm preparing for, for you, you need to give me a try. And so if you're taking notes, as there is a note-taking outline in your program, I want to tell you why I personally tried Jesus. And the reasons that I personally tried Jesus come from this passage. So notice firstly, I tried Jesus because he showed me the way. I tried Jesus because he showed me the way. What was this way that he showed me? Look at verse 6. Jesus said to him, he's speaking to Thomas here. Remember, Thomas asked that question in verse 5. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. Notice that, that word way. He says, I am the way. And it's a word that means the road or the route. I am the road. I am the route. What, what road or what route was he, he talking about? Well, he had been speaking about going somewhere. And in, in verse 2, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. So he's talking about going, going to prepare a place for them. He says the same thing in verse 3. He says, if I go and prepare a place, I will come again. So he's talking about going. And then in verse 3, to the disciples, he said, um, he says, in you, verse 4, you know the way where I am going. And, and, and to which Thomas responds in, in verse 5, he says, no, we don't know the route. We don't know the road. You see, he's thinking uh, literal in that way. And, and so 
you know, so he's saying, what way are you talking about? And so Jesus in verse six says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And so Jesus showed me the way to the Father, and the Father is in heaven. Therefore, Jesus showed me the way to heaven. This had been a major theme of his teaching throughout his ministry, if we think about it. He has been teaching them his mission. He'd been with them for three years, and he'd been teaching them his mission and where he will go back to. But they didn't really understand it. They didn't get it. They, they, they should have gotten it earlier, but they didn't get it the way they should have. And he also told them how to get there. But remember what Thomas asked here in verse 5. He's perplexed a little bit. He says, he says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the route or the road? How do we know the way? He's saying, Lord, how do we know? How do we know the route? In other words, he's saying, Jesus, we tried to plug the address, Jesus's home in ways, but it came up, no address found. Thomas has been, you know, he's been called doubting Thomas, not just because of his doubts, but because of the questions he asks. I think that's why they call him doubting Thomas. And so some people say that if you opened his his head and looked at his brain, it would be a question mark. Now, it's important, and we can't make too much fun of Thomas for that, because when we think about it, in in this case, um, he asked perhaps the most important question in, in Scripture. And perhaps, you know, what Jesus answers here as he teaches him, he turns that question mark into an exclamation sign. And so he asked this question. And because of this question, we have one of the greatest I am statements in all of scripture. And so Thomas is saying, we don't precisely know where heaven is. What's the route to take to get to heaven? What's the road that we would need to take to get to heaven? We don't know where to find it. We don't know where the Father is. How do we know the way? We don't have any maps of how to find the Father's house. That's why Jesus answers in verse 6 and says, I am the way. He's saying, Thomas, you don't need to know how to get there. You just need to know that I am the way. I'll show you the way. And this is what, this answer by Jesus is really what makes heaven such an exclusive place. It's a place where anybody can go if they want, but it's exclusive to people who follow the way. And so Jesus says to him, and he says to me, trust me, I will take you there. When the moment comes for you to get there, you trust me and I will take you there. Now, it's one thing when someone gives you directions and it's another thing when they take you there personally. I remember the first time, it was over 20 years now, where I first visited Monica's grandmother, grandparents in, in, um, uh, in Alabama. And um, it's, it's a town called West Blockton, and it's about uh, 30 minutes outside of Birmingham. And there were no street signs at that time for all the streets that are there, and there were many streets along this one main road. And... Uh, her grandparents just had the home phone, no cell phone. But they said to us, if you get off this exit and make a left, in about a mile, you'll find an IGA supermarket, right? Only supermarket in town. It just closed the other day, I heard. But they said, you find the IGA, and you call us from the IGA, and we'll come get you. So the first time we went there, we got to the IGA. Um, I don't think we had a cell phone then. We used a pay phone. We called them from there. And a few minutes later, her grandfather came down and he said, follow me. We followed him about another half a mile up and there was their street on the left. But all the streets looked the same. We would have kept going up and down that road. We would have missed it. And so it's one thing if somebody comes and they take you there versus you trying to find the way. And you know what happens with a lot of people today is that they try every way in this world. 
they try this spiritual way and that spiritual way and they aimlessly wander around this life with no direction. And they don't call on Jesus. They never try Jesus. Or they say, I want to try Jesus and something else. And so we see Jesus say here that I'm the one who could take you there. But Jesus says, if you believe in me, I will come and get you, whether it's through death or through the rapture. And so this verse here, verse 6, that we're looking at has significant implications in terms of salvation. Jesus is saying that he is the way to salvation and that um, he's saying that there's no other way that this can be taken, that he is the way that it could, he, to salvation. He's saying that he is the only way to the Father and therefore the only way to heaven because we would say the Father is in heaven. People may try other ways, but there is no other way. And so we see that this is a pretty exclusive claim. I mentioned a few minutes ago that heaven is an exclusive place, that heaven is open to anyone who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But it's an exclusive place. It's only for people who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And this claim that Jesus makes here is a pretty exclusive claim. There's no middle ground with this claim. He's saying, Thomas, I am the way. He didn't say, Thomas, I'm one of the ways. He said, Thomas, I am the way. I'm the, the root. And I can say that with surety because I'm following him on that way. And you can also. But notice the second reason why I try Jesus. I try Jesus because he told me the truth. He says in verse 6, he says, I am the way and the truth. And so not only is he the way, but in verse 6, he is also the truth teller. He is the embodiment of truth. He didn't only teach truth, which that's true. He taught the truth, but he is the truth. And that's why he can make this claim at the end of verse 6. Look at it. He says, no one comes to the Father but through me. Since he is the only way, no one could go to where the Father is except by him. Now, where is the Father? We pray it in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in? Everybody believes the Father is in heaven. And so he's making this very dogmatic, narrow statement that no one can get to where the Father is, which is heaven, except through him. And so I think you would agree that this is a very narrow and dogmatic statement. And some people don't like that type of statement. They say this isn't fair. What about other religions? But if you believe that Jesus is the truth, then truth is dogmatic. There aren't multiple truths about one thing. There can only be one truth. And so the question that we have to ask is it the truth that there are many ways to God? Or is it the truth that there is only one way to God? Well, this verse says there is one way. Now, we know that there have been other people throughout history that have claimed to be God um, or claimed to be from God. And some have said that they're a prophet from God. Others have said that they are only one of the ways to God. But Jesus here is saying that he is the only way. And the reason why I believe that this is um, true is that everything that Jesus has said and did in his whole lifetime has come true. And so I believe what he says here will also come true. And so we can trust him. We have had certain people making certain claims. If you remember P.T. Barnum, he um, owned a circus, um, and, but we all, you know, he said of his show that this is the greatest show on earth, right? Uh, David Koresh, if you remember him um, from this uh, uh, cult group called the Branch Davidians, um, he called himself the final prophet. 
claims are also true of those in biblical history as well. David was said to be what? A man after God's own heart. Moses was called who? A friend of God. John referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And just like in secular history, when people read all these claims that people make about themselves, they kind of shake their head and, and, um, and they, they dismiss it. But, but perhaps one of the biggest makers of claims was our Lord Jesus Christ. And every time that he made a claim, he was telling the truth. He says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. This is another one of his I am statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life is one of his I am statements. You know, he didn't say in this verse here that he had the bread of life. What did he say? He said, I am the bread of life. He claimed to be able to completely satisfy anyone who comes to him. He's not talking about physical bread here. If you remember, people were looking for that physical bread. And it's in this context he made that statement. I am the bread of life. You're looking for this physical bread that's going to satisfy you for a couple of hours. He's saying, I can completely satisfy just as physical bread and water satisfy physically. He's saying, believe on me and I will completely satisfy the basic human needs and desires of your life. In John 8 and verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so the Jews, they associated light with God's presence. And Jesus' light reveals, it shows us our sin. It shows us a need for a savior. And so he's saying he is the light of the world. And so anyone who's walking around this world and they're walking around in darkness, he's saying, I can show you the way out of this world. And then he makes another claim in John 10 and verse nine. This is the passage called the good shepherd. And he says, I am the door. Um, he who, and if anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now this talks about the way we find salvation, that it is only through Christ that we can find salvation. Um, and he further in this passage, just a couple verses down in John 10, 11, he talks about being the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, as he goes through this passage in John chapter 10, he's making a contrast here between the bad shepherds. And he's using an imagery uh, that people would know uh, about uh, shepherds who would actually be out there with sheep. And he's drawing this contrast with the religious leaders of that time. And he's saying he is a good shepherd. The religious leaders of that time, they were bad shepherds. They didn't care for the people. Just like there were bad shepherds who didn't care for the, the sheep, the animal sheep. And so a bad shepherd would allow the sheep to, dry, he, to die. He talks about uh, a thief or a robber coming into the sheepfold. And the bad shepherds he would either be gone or they'd be asleep and they wouldn't be concerned about it. Maybe because they didn't own the sheep, they were just being paid to watch the sheep. And he's saying that's not how he is. You see, he's saying that I was willing to sacrifice my life so that the sheep might live. The bad shepherd would be willing to save their life and have the sheep die. But Jesus was willing to give up his life so that the sheep might live. And then with regard to salvation, he made his greatest claim here in verse six. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so I tried Jesus because he showed me the way. He told me the truth. But notice thirdly, I tried Jesus because he gave me life. He says in verse 6 again, I am the way and the truth and the life. He's claiming to have 
a monopoly on life here. And, um, and we could ask the question, what kind of life is he talking about here? Is he talking about a good life on this earth? Is he talking about a worry-free life? You know, we've all heard of the book or the statement, your best life now. And you could imagine if this is our best life now, you know, what, what is to come after? You know, what does that say about heaven? What does that say about hell, right? And so is that what he's talking about? Is he talking about a life having no burdens, no, no problems? Who here has never had a burden or a problem? Anthony, you've never had a burden or a problem? Okay. I'm your burden or your problem, right? He's like, yeah, besides me. <laughs> but there's no such thing, right? There's no such thing as a worry-free life. And so he must be referring, when he says that here, when he says, I am the life, he must be referring to some other type of life. Now, it may seem, sound simplistic, but the word life here just means life as opposed to death. It means that if we want to be sustained in life, then it has to be through Jesus Christ. And he's also talking about eternal life here. Somewhere else in the Father's house. Remember, he had been talking about the Father's house. So he's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way to the Father's house. I'm telling you the truth about that. And I am the life. I will give you eternal life in the Father's house. Jesus had spoken about this many times before. For example, John 10, 28. He says, and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. There's security for the righteous when they come to God. You see, if somebody's telling you that you can lose your salvation, you go back and you look at John 10, 28 and you could tell me that we are stronger than Jesus then if we can lose our salvation. I give them eternal life, he says, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So people will say, okay, then we, nobody can snatch him out, but we can pull ourselves out of his hand. So then we're more powerful than Jesus, we're saying. This is security for the righteous when we're in Christ. John 5, 39 says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. He says, it is these that testify about me. You see, people have been reading the scriptures and they're trying to find eternal life. And they're trying to find eternal life in scripture. And Jesus is saying in John 5, 39, it is these, these scriptures that testify about me. So in essence, he's saying the same thing in John 5, 39, that he's saying in John 14, 6, that I am the way. You're searching scriptures and you're looking for eternal life. You're only going to find me. I'm eternal life. All scriptures, Old and New Testament, speaks about him. He is the point of the Bible. We think some people ignore the Old Testament. They say that's just the old God. And the New Testament is the new God. But if you search all the scriptures, you're only going to find Christ. It's only about Christ because Christ is the answer to salvation. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He came for us. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He came into the world. He sent Christ. God sent Christ that whoever believes in him. There's again that exclusive exclusivity of it. It's not just uh, universal salvation. It's whoever believes in Christ shall not perish, but will have everlasting life in the Father's house. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's the same thing John 14.6 is saying. It's all through Christ. And so we could ask the question, when you're sick, who do you go to? Doctor, right? All right. When you need law advice, who do you go to? What's that? L lawyer. What's that? Attorney. Yeah. When you're scared about where you'll go after you die, who should you turn to? Jesus. It shouldn't be 
a psychic, or a palm reader. It should be to Jesus. He's the way shower. He's the truth teller. And he is the life giver. He's the only one who has the power to deal with those fears that we might have. And the only one that can give eternal life in heaven. So stop going through ritual. Stop going through what you can do. Stop trusting in yourself and start trusting in the only one that can save you. You see, we read through scripture and we see that Christ Jesus came to be our savior, but he also came to be our friend. He wants to be our friend. And one of the hallmarks of a true friend is that they tell you the truth. And Christ here is telling the truth about the way to heaven. And when Jesus said, I am the way, he made every other way a dead end. You're driving down the road and you see dead end and you got to turn around. That's what Jesus is saying here. Any other way that you're trying is a dead end. Turn around and go back on my route. When Jesus said, I am the truth, he made every other way a lie. And so you're listening to some other way and the light's flashing. Liar, liar, liar. Jesus, he says, turn around and follow my way. And when he said here that I am the life, he made every other way death he's the way the truth and the light if you go to england there's a place called hampton court and it was henry the eighth that really bought it and put this um some hedges around it that served as a maze are you guys going to the corn maze again this year with the youth maybe yeah um but this is hedges and they're tall and it forms in in a maze and and um and people who have gone there have said that you will get lost you'll eventually get lost but after a while somebody who works there will come up to you they'll see this frustration they'll say would you like some help are you lost now this person knows the place and they know where you are and they could lead you out from that place now, some people have said, no, I'll figure it out myself. And then they spend hours more trying to figure it out themselves. Others says, yes, we're hopefully lo hope hopelessly lost. Yes, please help us get out of this maze. So the question is, if you want to get out of that maze, you have to admit that you're lost. You have to give up your own efforts and trust in the worker who's there who knows the way out to lead you out. I'll ask the same question. How do we get to heaven? It's the same way as in that maze. We admit that we're lost. We give up our own effort to save ourselves. And we trust in Jesus to get us out of this life. That's it. Jesus wants to be in our lives. I don't know about you, but I want someone like that in my life. I have him in my life. He's someone who tells me the truth. He's one that always told the truth. And he's one that I know that I could trust. And I hope that you can trust him too. Let's pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, please, no one looking around this morning. And also, please don't try and distract the person next to you. We don't want to interrupt what the Holy Spirit is doing. I wonder if you're here and you're listening to me, if you can say that without a doubt, you believe in Jesus Christ and that you believe without a doubt that when you die, you know for sure that you will go to heaven. Do you know that for sure? Just raise your hand. You know that for sure? Amen. Hands all around. Thank you. If you couldn't answer that, maybe it's because you don't know. You don't know where you'd spend eternity. You've never placed your faith and trust in Christ. And if that's the case with you, you can put your trust in Christ today. And if you want to place your faith and trust in Christ, why don't you just pray this along with me? Just, just pray this within your, your heart. You could say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to save me. 
I'm a sinner. I admit that. I'm not good enough to get into heaven. But thank you for leaving heaven to die on the cross in my place and for taking the punishment that I deserve. And as the risen Lord, please save me. Please forgive my sins. Please take me to the Father's house in heaven. Thank you for showing me the way. Did you pray that this morning? Again, no one's looking around. And just like there were others who a few moments ago were able to raise their hand with surety that they know where they're going. Again, no one looking around, please. If you prayed that this morning, would you just slip your hand up just so I see it? Maybe you prayed to receive Christ this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else, you prayed this morning to receive Christ. Thank you. You want to know that when it comes time to go out of this world, that Christ will take you to the Father's house. Lord God, you know the status and the condition of everybody's heart this morning. And I pray for those who indicated that they would like to receive Christ or maybe it's some other reason, Lord, you know the status of their heart. I pray, Lord God, that you would give them the courage to be able to come up to Pastor Anthony and I and let us know that. We'd love to come alongside you on your spiritual journey. But Lord God, thank you for your word, how simple it is and how easy it is to understand. We pray that you would apply the word again to all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.